In the summer of 1990, a group of painters and decorators from Northern Ireland landed a dream job in Iraq. Just weeks into their contract, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invaded the neighboring state of Kuwait. Western governments were outraged. A US coalition prepared for war and the men from Northern Ireland found themselves at the center of an international hostage crisis. And so we're in the middle of it, you know. There's no reason for us to be here. They're stuck out here and you could do nothing about it. So we want you to tell them back home, the leaders of the so-called West, and the multinationals to cut their profits and let us out. Good to see you. Good to see you, but... <laughs> I don't know why. You haven't changed much. It's yeah, going to be myself. We're both down now, isn't it? There's another one. <laughs> uh, well, sir. How are you going? Not too bad. Good to see you. We'd all worked together before. All in a new well. We're a mixture of, of Protestant and Catholic. All working class. Worked with them for years. All good lots. Who would have thought we'd have made it this far? Much anyway. Ah, but you put on a bit of weight. No, we can't. We always get on. It was always taking the mic out of one, uh, you know, stuff like that. And we just got on really well. There's <laughs> Michael. Oh, yeah. Michael, what a very good song. I'll put it on, Sean. Good to see you. The farm that we worked for, it was a mixed workforce and never any issues. So we're all sort of interlinked and we all sort of no, you off each other, anyway. Are you doing anything now, I've cut down now, Bobby. I'm only doing five and a half days a week now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's more than you've done 30 years ago. <laughs> I love going away to, to work. Different jobs, different people, different towns, different, yeah, brilliant. That 30 years yeah, flew, didn't it? Oh, God, it's no, it's no time at all, you know. I know. Some, 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 some good memories. Oh, well, you know? yeah. yeah. It's taken me most of Europe, sort of all over the UK. I've done mansions. I've worked in the Old Bailey in London, uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall, and uh, I've, I've saw a few places that I wouldn't normally have seen. <laughs> You're going to work in a couple of hours' time. So I said, okay. When we started working for Deluxe Decorators, it was just all, all local work, and then they got in with me, Yvonne, and then we started doing boats in England and Germany and into Europe and then to America. The money was better when you're going away. I was working in London at that time and we were approached to go to Iraq. I said, I'll go to the moon. You boys must have been approached at home. Yeah, well, we were, because uh, we were working at XL Glass. The hmm. first time I actually, I didn't hear about it was, but we were playing golf and we were sitting in Armagh Golf Club and Farrell says there's about a uh, big jab coming up, but I can't tell you too much about it. He says, but you'll love it. And that was, of course, Baghdad. And I got the, he just said to me, I'm going. <laughs> I wasn't getting the option. <laughs> I just yeah. told you you're going. And you need to go and get jobs. No, but I only, man, I'd lost the weight. Four, 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 four stone in six weeks. And I didn't realise it, but I was like, coming home, to coming home like Marlon Monroe. <laughs> I was like Marlon Monroe coming home. <laughs> no, like, but we were hungry when we got home and thin. Yeah. And poor. Yeah. You speak for yourself. No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't drink all my money. <laughs> In 1990, Northern Irish Construction and Fit Out Company, My Van joined a team of international contractors working on Saddam Hussein's al Sajud Palace in Baghdad. I was ostensibly there to develop new business. Bit of the Irish Blarney, we would go and visit people in the Ministry of Oil, in the Ministry of this, in the Ministry of that. And there was development to be had, and everyone and their granny was there from every country uh, trying to sell whatever they were trying to do, services and products. 
I knew that the war had ended uh, with Iran in August 88, but international travel is something that I always enjoyed. So yeah, I went there and I actually really enjoyed it. Absolutely no concern at all. Coming from Northern Ireland, we all, we'd all lived through the Troubles. I was 10 in 1969, uh, so I was well used to um, the Troubles and a militarised country. So it didn't have a bearing on my decision to go. Saddam Hussein wants to make the once romantic city of Baghdad again the centre, the powerhouse of Arab ambition. His success against Iran has made Saddam Hussein by far the strongest leader in the region, and he knows it. He exudes self-confidence. I would be one wouldn't take much notice of news, don't read newspapers, except for maybe the back page of the sport or something. And I think my wife says to me at one stage, you know, there's things going on here. These are not why he's going there. And uh, we're saying, I'll be all right, it's OK. I think the words are the same as she dropped us at the airport. From the very start, I didn't want him to go. I watched the news, I knew there was something going on, and it was about oil, I knew that. Um, but Bernie Dobbs said, you just read too much into things, Sharon, you know. The United States has given a cautious welcome to the news. But throughout this crisis, President Bush has said that Iraq must meet the demands of all UN resolutions. It just happened to be the night that I recorded the news. That was when it came out to say that he had signed the peace thing with Kuwait. They weren't going to invade the country over oil. So he says, you see, everything's fine. I suppose I thought, you know, it's going to be good money, it'll set us up, and hopefully everything will go from there. I had just turned 21 before I went out. It was a bit of an adventure, I suppose, somewhere different and something new to see and, you know, broaden your horizons, basically, you know. I remember stepping off the plane and the heat just was intense. But I did look at the paper, and the paper was given the word temperatures. And I found Baghdad on the list, and Baghdad was the hottest place in the world that day. Getting the bus in from the airport, it just looked like something out of the Arabian Nights. And then when we got to the hotel, the hotel was fantastic. The Iraqi people they were just loving the end of the war. They were enjoying being out on the streets. They were lovely people, and they were living under a strict regime, but then they were living in a very fractured society as well. Where we were, you had the mosques, the architecture was all different, and we definitely knew you, were, you weren't in Northern Ireland. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot of security in that, but the top places, like palaces and that, were all guarded by armed soldiers. But we had probably more freedom of movement than some of the locals, you know, because <laughs> we were actually working for Saddam. Everywhere you went, at every junction or roundabout, there was a mosaic of Saddam Hussein, so he must have been a popular guy. <laughs> he was everywhere. In later days, then, we sort of learned from different people, you know, just how afraid they were of him. The West has been only too well aware of Saddam's involvement in Middle East terrorism and his use of chemical weapons against Kurdish villages. The dictator now being likened by many to Adolf Hitler. He controlled the radio, he controlled the, the TV. And, and the man said to us, you know, the walls have ears. So who is this man? Saddam Hussein al-Tafriti. The popular press calls him the Beast of Baghdad, modern-day Hitler, Stalin reincarnate, and so on. Saddam is the classic dictator, isn't he? You, you get into power, 
you consolidate power and you take out all opposition. And that's really what he achieved very successfully. And to be honest, although he was a pretty odious human being, it was a remarkably stable country. I think anybody who lived in Iraq, even briefly as I did, knew that it was um, really ruled by fear, consciously ruled by fear. Most Iraqis simply kept their heads down without meddling in politics. Very quickly he learned to not say too many things. He didn't talk about the president. Uh, you didn't talk about his staff. Um, you didn't air political views. And in my van, that was one of the things we did. You didn't talk about politics. Everyone was told that. So we were quite uh, reserved. And you had to be reserved. That was the way it was in Iraq. And you learned that fairly quickly. My first job was to identify and agree with the Iraqis every piece of material that was going to be used on the palace. The windows came from Harland with big, strong, bulletproof windows, solid as a rock. In the palace, my van had to complete the wall, floor and ceiling finishes. And peculiarly, that involved bulletproof windows, gold taps for the uh, presidential bathrooms, very, very ornate marbles and granites. It was a cornucopia of all of the best things that you'd imagine shoved into a big bling. I remember walking in through the big doors. I'd say the own doors must have been 20 foot high. And as soon as you walked in, it just opened up into a big dome where there was this massive chandelier. Everybody saying, I wonder what that cost. And it looked like it was millions. You know, and everything else was marble, gold leaf around the roofs. Very expensive. <laughs> well, I was in doing a bit of touch up in the ceiling one day. I was touching one of the walls up, and the mobile tower up. And of course, you're walking around, you're, and the air conditioning's going, and everything's great. Next one I heard, tick. just heard the noise and looked up. The big, massive, long chandelier, the big, fancy one. Yeah. Just pushed this. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I pulled it back, and I pulled it back, all I was ding, 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 ding. All the, all the oh, crystal the balls were falling. <laughs> broken. I was trying to run nothing because of the parts of the overalls. Put them in the overalls. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, Bobby, but my name's all over the palace, behind the walls. Oh, is it? Uh, <laughs> I everywhere I went, yeah. I, 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 the, well. My name, did, you uh, did you do that to Paul Terry? Yeah, so it's probably still there. <laughs> The lads from the painting then, about, you know, I knew most of them, and then, like, the Maivan guys, I knew a lot of those as well. You know, when you're in that situation, you get to know other people as well, you know. So you weren't short of friends. <laughs> it's different for the single men and the married men. The married men are willing to work more hours. The single men, they were looking to get finished as soon as they could and out on the town. There was a, a nightlife to it. You used to go around to different places, you know, for parties and stuff. You know, just like having the night out at home here. All our expats would have came to us. I mean, you'd had Germans, you'd had English, you would have the Swedes, you'd had all different nationalities. Well, the Mayvon Club, was, well, there, there, was, there was a swimming pool and there was table tennis and stuff like that. And you could have had it. Had a wee, wee casual drink and all that carry on. No, we think like that. It was a good club. Well, that was that was the big social place for music. I had barbecue nights, a bar. So it was never a dull moment for me, really. <laughs> I was I was out most nights. They were told to bring a hundred dollar bills and you were getting 350 or so dinners. For us, it was 50 pounds. It was like monopoly money. You were getting a big thing of notes this side. It was just, it was insane. 
you're looking at the money, you're going here, there's 10, there's 20. You know, just take it. Ah, oh, this is fantastic, you know. But that was the way it was. You're living beyond the means of the normal Iraqis who were there. That became very clear to me. They had nothing, you know, in the shops. And it was basic, you know, it was like stepping back in time for us. I remember having an apple coming from the Maivan Club, and uh, there was a wee girl, she must have been about four or five. And she was just looking at us, and I offered her the apple. And she wouldn't take it. And there was a stone sitting, so I set the apple on the stone. And we walked on. We looked back again, and the wee girl had run down, lifted the apple, and waved and run on. <laughs> Iraq has coveted Kuwaiti territory and oil reserves for many years. Last week, President Saddam Hussein demanded compensation for lost oil revenue. And he's repeatedly threatened the Kuwaiti island of Bubiyan. Iraq also claims the Remalia field. Into the middle of that following week, Kuwaiti diplomats had come to Iraq again and had been back and said that they weren't happy with, that they wanted some, some other kind of resolution. Maggie Thatcher, they're, they're advising them not to invade Kuwait. You know, this was all going on. The Iraqi president has made no secret of his ambition to dominate the Gulf and to become the arbiter of the Arab world. To that end, Iraq allowed Kuwait no room for compromise in the peace talks which broke down in Saudi Arabia yesterday. There was a BBC overseas or something that they could watch every night at six o'clock or whatever. And he says, there's absolutely nothing happening here, Sean. There's nothing on the news. There's nothing anywhere, so it's, it's fine. They, he was to they were totally oblivious to what was happening. Oil-rich Kuwait is invaded by Iraq and asks the rest of the world for help. 350 tanks overwhelmed the tiny country and the Iraqis seized power. Iraq's President Hussein warns his troops will turn Kuwait into a graveyard if foreign powers intervene. I had been up during the night. I think there were three hours ahead of us. And so I had heard the news at six o'clock in the morning. I immediately lifted the phone landing and phoned the number and it went dead. We had heard about him going into Kuwait. At the start, we weren't that troubled. What information we were getting, you know, didn't seem that bad. We thought maybe it was more of a skirmish than a real invasion. On the newspaper was, Kuwait had a revolution. They were there to help, which was lies, because he invaded, but he didn't tell his own people that. His own people were oblivious to that, because obviously they're not getting any outside news. There's no internet name there, don't forget. The refugees arrived from Kuwait City and stuff, you know, into the hotel. And that would have been about the sort of the start of it. A week after it happened, the international operator had phoned me and said it was a call from Iraq. I, I just remember saying, Bernie, where are you? And he says, I'm in Iraq. I said, no, I know, but where are you? <laughs> and he says, I'm in, I'm still, we're still in the hotel. And I says, do you, you do know what's happening, don't you? He says, yeah, yeah, we're fine here. Everything's just, just normal here. He says, it'll be okay, I'll be in touch again in a few days. And the line went dead. Kept trying, I don't know many times a day to ring the number. It never worked. There was no communication whatsoever. The world has roundly condemned the invasion. No voice has been raised in support of Baghdad. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait defies every principle for which the United Nations stands. If we let it succeed, no small country can ever feel safe again. The aircraft carrier USS Independence is now being sent to reinforce American naval strength in the Gulf. 
as the West ponders over what to do next. We listened to the BBC World Service and when they started actually moving warships and flying planes in, we started to talk about it more. But coming from here, compared to the English space, we weren't as uh, uptight about it. I come from West Belfast. It's a very militarised place in, in the end days. Constant army and police on the, on the streets. Road checks, you know, it's just the norm. Working in, in Iraq was just the exact same as working in Northern Ireland, getting searched. You know, when you grew up in the days of Belfast, you'd get searched going through into the city centre. It's just the same. The palace was inside an army compound. Guns everywhere and all that carry on, you know, but we weren't afraid of it. Bit an armed guard one day and the armed guards walking around and making his own business. The next month the English lads are rolling up the stairs. Oh, the man with the gun, there's a man with a gun. Being curious, we went down to see what was going on. This guy was walking about with a wee sidearm on, you're going, God's sex when they pistol. Everywhere you went, you know, on the high-rise buildings there was anti-aircraft guns. There was a, a barracks beside the palace, and you'd have seen the recruits training. It was not an army, it was just people conscripted. It was all shapes, sizes, big, small, fat, skinny. It was just so hilarious. Some had boots, some had trainers, some had nothing on their feet. These people weren't ready to fight a war. You'd have seen young lads walking around with Kalashnikovs, 11, 12 years of age, and walking around with an AK-47 over, over their shoulders, like the gun nearly as big as them. Then we got told through the presidential diwan that, you know, travel would be restricted. We'll not be able to leave until things are resolved. And that, you know, you'll be safe, you're our guest, you'll just be our guest for a while. And Saddam would have referred to us as his special guests. 5,000 Britons are stranded in Iraq. The British Embassy says they should not try to leave. So far, there is no explanation as to why Iraq has closed its borders. It could be a tactical military move, or it could be a gesture that Iraq has the power to hold hostages within its borders. We're all shocked. We were just informed that all land, sea and air borders were closed. And, you know, that was it. It didn't matter who you were, really. You couldn't go anywhere. The government couldn't do anything. We actually had to move out of the Novotel. Um, we had to move into like staff, staff houses that were owned by Maivan and different companies. Nobody really knew for sure what, what was happening. We all started to get a little bit more worried, you know, that we're caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. The British ambassador, Harold Walker, is very much aware of the dangers too. It's his job to discourage the British people who are held here from trying to get away illegally. I say no heroics, don't run risks, stick within the law. For one member country of the UN to invade another is absolutely as sinful as you can get in international relations, and you, Iraq, must get out. Part of my ambassadorial job was to argue this toss with senior Iraqi officials, to no effect, of course, because the Iraqi government at that time were quite cocky. I mean, they were quite self-confident. Saddam had gained power by shooting his opponent. He had assassinated the incumbent. And so there was a feeling that, um, you know, you didn't look sideways to Saddam or you wouldn't be seen again, and your family wouldn't be seen again, and your family's friends wouldn't be seen again. It was that ruthless. In her first public statement in two weeks, Mrs. Thatcher said Britain would not negotiate over the Western hostages. Saddam Hussein is now trying, in his tactics, to hide behind Western women and children and use them as human shields and use them as part of his negotiations. Thatcher was seen as one of Saddam's harshest critics and therefore biggest enemies. And I think a lot of the human shields felt that that was not helping their cause. And they watched the French and people from other countries go out first. They clearly, Saddam was very clever at 
tweaking this international scenario that he was playing off countries against each other. And that certainly weighed heavily in the minds of the British and Northern Irish human shields that was their cause being damaged by the animosity between Margaret Thatcher and Saddam Hussein. It started to change once we weren't getting paid. We did get an allowance, I think it was 50 dinners a day or a week or something. But that was a bit of a worry as well, you know, about, about getting money and getting access to bank accounts and stuff as well. We decided then that we wouldn't work on the palace. They had a meeting with us to say if we didn't work, I wouldn't get a visa. So then we ended up working more hours to get the visa to get out. Once the trouble had all started, then you had to go through their switchboard. When you give out the UK, and sometimes it just cut off the phone. So you just kept trying and trying, and maybe took a few days. You know, you were sort of explaining, it's not England, it's Northern Ireland. And the odd time, they would say, okay, okay. And you got through, but it wasn't too often. <laughs> I usually started off by saying, if this cuts off, I'll ring you in a few days or whatever. But uh, everything's okay. The family men and stuff, when they couldn't get phone calls, and you see the reaction to that, you know, and it's hard to watch that, you know, because they go from a high when they have the phone call to later on they go down. It went down to probably having a telephone call every second day to nothing. Nothing at all. Nobody knew anything. We kind of just went on. But you see now that, that you look back on it, it's terrible. Having that dread every day and maybe not even sleeping for a few days. You just went on for your children. As far as financial support to my wife. The first few weeks we were there, we had made money and a certain amount of it then went to my wife every week. After that, there was no real financial support. There was never any, any other offer of financial help from nowhere, no. It was pretty tough, but um, we got by, yeah. At this time then, money was getting tight at home. And I was playing for Armagh City at the time. And they actually then organised a charity thing and they... They used to send money home to my wife. They used to give her a hundred pound a week, which was fantastic. It was much appreciated. I can remember my mum trying to shelter me from it. They didn't tell me anything directly as such, just that my, my dad had to work away for, for longer. But I was checking sort of newspapers when people were coming up into the house. I was sitting at the bottom of the stairs and trying to hear what was, what was going on. I can remember my mum being a little bit afraid you know it was a tough time because I knew that there was there was troubles with money because my dad was the main breadwinner at the time so and yeah my mum I can remember sort of crying a little bit you know her friends calling over her on the phone all the time sort of talking about it and there was just a lot of I think sort of fear so I knew something big was was happening but I didn't really understand at the, at the time what was going on
Western democracies have never been good at coping with outright dictators, and in Saddam Hussein's case, they've usually got it badly wrong. Throughout the Arab world, radicals regard him as the new Nasser, the man who, like Egypt's leader in the 50s and 60s, challenges the power of the West. He can't lose. If the West intervenes, he becomes a martyr, and if it backs down, he wins anyway. Any offensive against Iraq would no doubt mean risking at least some of those hostages' lives. For the moment, then, they will wait. But temptation for a first strike will increase as numbers swell and strategic position is improved. Alan and I had given uh, accommodation to most of the ITN news crew that had come out. The ITN news crew had access to Western newspapers and some of the red tops had published somewhere around September 24 hours to go, 24 hours to war. So um, it was quite a worrying time. The Iraqi leader warned of the deadly consequences of a confrontation. I was sent into Baghdad as part of the ITN team there and began to realize the scale of the problem there. This is a very, very human problem at the heart of a huge, impending war and a massive diplomatic crisis. But what we started to realize within hours of landing in Baghdad was the human face of this, the terrified, frightened folk who just by pure happenstance had ended up as the trapped, captive, innocent victims of this global crisis. We used to smuggle our radio in to the palace and we'd listen to the home service. Margaret Thatcher was in. It was sort of what was coming from there that we were worried about. The coalition and coming in and invading Iraq or bombing or whatever, because we were near complexes that would have been hit, like power stations. Second guessing Iraqi strategy is impossible. The hostages used to escape from the horror of what they were stuck in pretty regularly to the social club down at Myvan, and we got invited down a couple of times. And they became pretty boisterous affairs, these parties. They certainly let their hair down. I think it was a moment to escape, perhaps to sort of dive into a bit of oblivion and forget the awfulness of what was around. But good on them. I mean, you could hardly blame them for wanting to have a party and, you know, get themselves away from what was in front of their eyes, which was the uncertainty of their lives, the helplessness of it all. He says, we'll go and play a pool, and then we're bored of it. I says, you're not supposed to be enjoying yourself here. <laughs> but it was good crack, uh, and it lifted everybody. People took on different roles and stuff. In. Bobby Buchanan the Joker, Bernie the Joker. Peter was a wind-up merchant, always cracking and messing about and planting half-truths. <laughs> it was just everybody's way of coping, but it kept up in good spirits. Jerry Fern, a lovely, lovely man, gentleman. He's actually passed away. And he could sing like you, know, you couldn't believe. And the Irish ladies and, and the nurses, they loved him. They, they fawned over him like they, they thought there was nothing like it because he, he, he loved this. He loved the attention. We all made a conscious effort to try and keep the place upbeat. We would have people coming, our neighbours, coming out and hugging me, Mr. Grenville, nothing will happen. You are my human shield. You know, things like that, which were really funny. And we did things like that to try and keep the morale up, uh, consciously, to try and keep everyone stable, you know, because there were people who tried to leave and tried to escape, and that was the wrong approach. You know, you had to stay. Just underneath the surface, you could tell that they were as frightened as anybody else, terrified about the consequences. 
Were they going to be sacrificed by Saddam in this terrible, impending war that was likely to break out? Saddam was playing for time, and he was playing with their lives. I think our hearts went out for them. We wanted to tell their stories. We felt, if anything, maybe it would help to get them home, help to keep them alive. Deep down, the boys from Belfast who are painting and decorating Saddam Hussein's palace are just as frightened by the helplessness of their position. Only they hide it by tough talk. Minister, we're in the middle of it, you know. There's no reason for us to be here. We said before we finished our contract, you know, we should be our way home. They're stuck right here and you can do nothing about it. So we want you to tell them back home, the leaders of the so-called West, and the multinationals to cut their profits and let us out. British Embassy certainly said all the right sort of words and tried to assure the human shields that everything was being done and it was all going to work out well in the end. But I got a sense from my visits to the Embassy that they were a bit nonplussed about what to do. They didn't really know how to handle it. What can a consular department in an Embassy do for a British subject in distress? It is strictly limited if the host government is tough. So really you mustn't expect more than how to get help with getting legal advice, decent conditions in the prison. And if I admit to a mistake on the part of myself, my embassy, it was that we were not quick enough to say to the Foreign Office, look, we need more money to um, spend on the necessities of life for our people. But it's too much to expect that, uh, to go back to the old days, Britain will turn out a gunboat. The anxiety, the fear that these people felt was just etched on their faces, you could tell. I would say we got fed up sometimes. And you just says to hell with this. Many a time I fought with myself to say, get up. The guys that I was with, the painters, we supported one another. God rest him, John McCausland. He would have been, I suppose at the start, he would have been around, you know, working, same as everybody else. Then, you know, became quiet and sort of stuck to himself. He didn't bother much with anybody, really. I think he was mentally stressed, very much so. Very, very smart individual, an excellent tradesman. You know, just to watch him going from being jokey and jovial and slowly slide down until one day I went into one of the rooms and he was sitting on, in the corner. It was very, very sad to watch, you know, but he just, he couldn't cope. He just, just got too much for him. He was shaking and, Michael, Michael, will, will we ever get out? I thought at one stage maybe you would never get home. You just didn't know. My main worry was that something would start before we got out, that it would start bombing, and if we were still going to be there and the war started, then we were going to be in danger. I may have had a plan drawn up that, that if things had got any worse, then we would have maybe tried to make a run for the border. Certain cars, uh, certain people would go with certain, certain drivers. Some fathers were more scared than others. The only time it got a wee bit was whenever I seen the, the the tracer shells lighting up the sky, get practicing for the planes coming in from the Yanks, you know what I mean? Well, I remember one night when the, the storm started, about four or five different thunderstorms at one time, 
But we woke up in the middle of the night and we thought that actually started bombing. I had never heard nothing like it. I was laying in bed and next went the door open. Peter came flying in. Michael, Michael, the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming. But obviously it wasn't, it was, it was thunder. But uh, it was funny, a bit of fun. Anybody who has covered Iraq during the period of Saddam and seen what he was capable of, from Halabja, chemical weapons, to the war with Iran, you were aware that he'd stop at very little. In this situation in which we are forced to keep a number of foreigners in order to prevent the death of many more foreigners. He warned that if the United States and its allies, the aggressive countries, as he called them, attacked Iraq, then those countries too would lose men, women and children. He was a man who would do almost anything to stay in power. If he got put under immense pressure, he could start taking hostages out and executing them in a way that we have seen in other conflicts. They started then taking the hostages and putting them at them strategic places. Every day you're kind of waiting on a call to say they had been taken. The longer it went on, the more they thought they were never coming back. It's what every Western man in Iraq is dreaming of, an exit visa and a plane ticket to freedom. John McCausland's qualifications were an Irish passport and his age. Out of the blue, the Iraqi government agreed to release all Irish citizens over 55. Suddenly, John, a 57-year-old carpenter from County Antrim, was packing his bags to go. Oh, blame me, I was, I was over the moon, hey. I was over the moon. When John got out, you know, it, it showed that there was people getting out. So that, that kind of gave us a little bit of hope, you know, that we would, we would get out. But it was just a matter of getting out before anything started. He got out to the ice passport thing and being over 50. And it was funny to watch all the guys who meant to be nice, but then thought they were nice. You know, quickly looking for an ice passport, but it was funny. All the very, very best, John. OK, OK. okay. But now he was on his way, seen off by his Northern Irish workmates. They aren't allowed to leave because they hold British passports. These are just some of the 480 Britons now existing in Iraq. This is the highlight of their week, a rare delivery of posts from home. Ironically, brought in by European embassies, because the British Foreign Office wouldn't allow them to use the diplomatic bag. The post from home became a huge factor for all the human shields. You know, getting a birthday card, getting a photo of the kids. It was the best birthday card Peter McNally had ever received. He was 50 last month. Me and my daddy have always had a special relationship and I just think he's amazing. He'll be 80 this year and he is so young at heart and just loves the fun and still enjoying himself. My mummy is a very quiet person and, you know, she probably didn't show so much, but she must have been so worried. If it was me being left with four kids on my own and my husband was a hostage in Iraq, it had to have had an effect on her, you know, and really all we wanted was to get them home. We were having masses in Lurgan and masses in Mahri and Novenas and everybody at home sort of came away family for a while. When we got the call, obviously, to say that Marathi was going to be on the TV, on the news that night, and they had showed all the, the fellas together, and my dad was actually opening up his birthday cards for his 50th birthday. And it was just, it was just incredible to see him on the TV. Bobby Buchanan missed his daughter's first day at school. 
But five-year-old Carrie sent Dad a painting so that he would never forget. I can remember that my sister had her picture shown uh, on the TV, uh, but I didn't. My picture wasn't shown. Um, and it was, I mean, it was nice that we sort of seen the pictures going through, but as a, as a child, I was, I was craving a connection um, to him. And I can remember this being really sort of, I don't know, it, it, it was strange. It was, it was tough. It was tough. Margaret Thatcher, who in the Saddam worldview was the real power behind United States policy, has vanished from the scene. That last week in November 1990 was quite extraordinary. I got the phone call that Thatcher had resigned. She'd gone. The Iraqi government could barely suppress their glee. And they thought, wow, this is it. There won't be war. Thatcher's not going to attack us. The next round of conservative leaders is going to be much milder than Thatcher. But when I went to then interview the British hostages, to be honest, their celebrations weren't that much more muted because they felt that she'd been pretty hostile to Saddam and it had not really helped their case. They felt that it was potentially a breakthrough. Eight days after John Major entered number 10, can he be his own man on the international stage as he grapples with the complex issues of the Gulf, GATT and Europe? I thought everything was going to change then when John Major came into power. And things seemed to have a bit of a momentum at that stage. There was more diplomatic stuff going on. You know, there was more contact between the British Embassy back to my van where we're hearing this. And the job was coming to an end, obviously, as well. That was what we put our efforts into, you know, get, get the palace finished and then, you know, say, OK, we're finished. You know, we've gone as far as we can go and, you know, there's no reason to keep us here anymore. Saddam Hussein caught everyone on the hop today by announcing that all the foreign hostages he's been holding ever since August will be free to leave. He sent a letter to the Iraqi National Assembly recommending that MPs should vote for the removal of travel restrictions on the people whom he's variously described as guests and heroes of peace. It seems clear to me that the Iraqis were caught by surprise by their president's own statement. They're now trying to put together some sort of scheme. They're talking a lot about exit visas and uh, uh, red tape. Saddam could see that the hostage policy wasn't going to work in the end. If the bombing started and some hostages were killed, he would be in even worse case than without. So one can't say what was going on in his mind, but he was eventually convinced that the policy was a bad one. Officials are still waiting for a presidential decree from Saddam. In that, they hope to find all the details of exactly how and when people can leave, because that's still far from clear. Come towards Christmas too, we're hoping against, well, more the family men they would get home for their families for Christmas. It was like a, a false alarm. It's going to happen tomorrow morning. Get yourselves ready and we're going to go and, and I'll die to death. We were told the night before just to pack our bags just as if we were going to go to work. Is it going to happen this time? Is this it? This is definitely going to happen. The next morning we got up, bagged and said, yes, it's a go. And away we went to the visa place. We're just parked up on, on the side of the street. You needed a visa, not only to get in, but you needed one to get back out. And apparently it had to be done by 12 o'clock or something like that. Half a lamb, nobody out yet. Quarter 12, nobody out yet. And then next thing, we've seen the boys coming out, shaking their hands, you know, we've got it, we've got the visas. Obviously then the bus erupted. And then we got straight to the airport. It was three red lights, the whole lot. Even then, you were sort of saying to yourself, uh, is this happening? <clears throat> Um, couldn't believe it. 
There was over 50 of us or, or more. And they whisked us right through past everybody, out onto the plane. It was still very muted because uh, we were still in Iraqi airspace. We went from Baghdad to uh, Jordan, Amman, and then to Damascus, and then to Larnaca, and then to Paris. When we got to about Paris, I knew we was out of Arab airspace. <laughs> and we were on our way home. The centre was building, the tension was built about getting home, and you just couldn't wait to get home. We made an agreement between us all, nobody would ring home until we got at least as far as Heathrow. And then we got to Heathrow, at that time, we were all really, you know, uptight. Couldn't wait to get home. Wow, we're, we're in Heathrow, so we're only an hour away. And then the plane was delayed five hours in Heathrow with fog. The Gulf Support Group in London started to pass on the good news to families and friends of hostages as soon as they could. Celebrations took the traditional form. Then the phone call started going. It was pandemonium and about all of them, all the different families about this has happened. So they were all making their way to Aldergrove. I can remember the drive down to the airport, sitting in the back of the car, looking out the window, and it just seemed like the longest drive ever. I was so excited to, to, to get there, and there were so many people in, in the airport. I can just remember them coming down the stairs and everyone, everyone cheering. I seen him straight away. He had, he had her back then and he was bouncing down the stairs and it was just, yeah, it was incredible. First thing I seen was my daughter, Kerry, uh, and the wife, she had, she had deal. It was just elated. What's it like having your father home again? I'm very glad that he's back because I've missed him so much and he's been away for a very long time. I actually have the photograph. When my daddy arrived at the airport, a photograph of him and my mummy. It was in the local newspaper the next week, yeah, the front of the paper. Oh, we were all delighted, you know, just all we wanted was him home. There seemed to be thousands of people there. And it didn't take you long. Fainting their family. There it is, look. Nice. There she is, alright. I remember they coming out of the visa office and the main one boys coming out and shaking the passports. That's right. That's right. The bus yeah, roaring, yeah. shouting. Yeah. Was, we knew we were going then, but definitely knew where we were going. And then, I mean, the plane was kind of waiting on us as well, wasn't it? From the yeah. airport, that well, was pretty sharp. <laughs> Straight through security. We didn't even have to show our passports or anything. Yeah. Just... I had a bit of a sweat because the people in front of me were being searched and I had, I had that VHS tape that I got from Jeremy Thompson, and I'd hidden that in between two old pictures, you know, just picture frames. As I opened my bag, I had a, a knife or a blade, a Stanley blade or something inside the thing, and I cut my finger, and the blood started pissing out of my finger. And I was, I was like, this here, oh, And the guy said, oh, go on, go on. And that's, you know, because I'd say they would have taken it off me if they'd have found it, you know. A VHS tip, and they said, "Well, what's what's going on here?" You know. Well, funny, but it was scary too at, at the airport. Uh, you know what I had in my, in my in my case? I was half sick. It was half full of dates. <laughs> what dates? I, was, for? I brought dates, and I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> honest, that's the God's honest truth. You can laugh if you want. Well, you said I had a sweat. What I had? Oh, I, had, I, was I told you earlier on them? about the crystals. <laughs> you want nothing but? Oh, yeah, he just threw them down again. Uh, Hang on. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Muslim <Mustn't> fix. <laughs> but they didn't search us all, because I didn't no, get searched. No, it, didn't it was a random you know, thing, I think. It was just... Yeah. But I had a couple of bits of marble as well that I'd taken from oh, the palace. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 I 
because I've never really sp uh, spoke about it, but I'm very emotional at the minute. And I've never been like that. It's great. Most of all, to see your family and be back in Northern Ireland. A couple of weeks even after we were home, and somebody stopped me up the street and, you know, asked me how I was. And I was just so, uh, so glad to be back. And it did actually change uh, my thinking on life. I was definitely more of a mellow person and nothing annoyed me as much. But the wife would probably tell you I'm sort of back to myself now. You pull it behind you, but for me then, the aftermath of it all, when you, you try to process it all, and I took a few days off and back to work. My attitude towards it changed. I was always, I had no problem going. But, but when am I coming home? It makes you appreciate what you've got. You know what I mean? It's a good old game, the building state, because you're not stuck in a factory or all that you hear there and everywhere, which is nice. All the hotels, Al Rashid, Babylon, Sheridan, you name it, we've been in them. And you'd never seen that if you hadn't been held captive. <laughs> It was a, a time in my life that means a lot uh, as an experience. And I would like to go back, yeah. Obviously, if times were different. I mean, Iraq was a lovely country. I know, I know Saddam was a tyrant, but it was still a lovely country. And uh, you know, the people were great and to see what way it's ended up now. You know, it, it's sad. It's very sad. The innocent always suffer, don't they? It's just something that links us all together now. Um, I suppose for the rest of your life. And I suppose Iraq will always be in my heart of it. <clears throat>
him And if the boys wanna fight, you better let them That you box in the corner, blasting out my favorite song The nights are getting warmer, it won't be long Won't be long till summer comes Now that the boys are here again
Haven't changed, had much to say But man, I still think them cats are crazy They were asking if you were around How you was, where you could be found I Told them you were living downtown Driving all the old men crazy The boys are back in town
back today Them wild out boys that had been away Haven't changed, had much to say But man, I still think them cats are crazy They were asking if you were around How you was, where you could be found I Told them you were living downtown Driving all the old men crazy Shaking what she'd got Man, when I tell you she was cool, she was red hot I mean she was steaming And that time over at Johnny's place Well, this chick got up and she slapped Johnny's face Man, we just fell about the place If that chick don't wanna know, forget her Summer comes. Now that the boys are here again. 